Oh, difficult to tell you exactly how one arrived at the physicality of it. I knew that it was, I mean, it was based on a corkscrew, really. Because that is, that is how his spine was in, the, um, in his skeleton, which existed, which I'd seen. I don't know how on earth he managed to move at all. It's extraordinary. Uh, how one gets, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, there is a dignity to him. There has to be a dignity to him. Uh, that is what the story is about. I think that was, that actually was, was fact, apart from anything else, and certainly something that David wanted to use as an image very, very considerably. And uh, we rather played into our hands as well, because um, David was rather anxious to show the full makeup of the Elephant Man rather earlier in the film than uh, certainly I felt it should be. I thought, I thought the longer we can hold on without the full image being seen, the better. And being as the makeup was therefore because we were so behind with it and we were working on it while we were shooting as well, this was going on. So, I mean, I'd be doing scenes with the, with the, with the uh, disguise on and then going <coughs> straight down to Old Kent Road to work with Chris Tucker and then and so on. So, I mean, it was... And I have to say that I was persuading Chris, saying, don't, don't get it ready too quickly because there's another sequence coming up uh, next week which I would love to do with the disguise. Partly because the disguise was so incredibly successful. As you say, it, 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 people remember it. Indeed, when it showed in Japan, it did so well in Japan that uh, see, I think it's the only reason that I saw any money from the back end of it because uh, there wasn't time to hide it. But uh, that aside, uh, my friend Jeremy Thomas, the producer, um, was in Japan and he said the streets of people, kids running around all the time with paper bags over their head and one piece saying, you know, saying, man, I found a man. So um, it was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it obviously had an impact, yeah, yeah. There was absolutely no need to improvise anything. It was, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not against improvisation if it's going to be, if it's going to uh, get you somewhere. There was a very, very precise and beautifully written script. And uh, I prefer it that way. I much prefer a writer to write it than me. <coughs> Even though Arguably, you know more about the character than anybody else. It doesn't mean to say that you're going to come up with the best lines. And uh, the, the scenes were so exquisitely written, there was no need to improvise anything, I don't think. I mean, it was, there was so much food for the imagination, and that's, after all, what any performance is based on an imaginative leap. Yes, we, we, we rehearsed, we did. Um, most of the scenes, as I said, certainly the scenes that uh, required a full makeup were all rehearsed because we had that day in between. Uh, and we had plenty of time to do it as well. It was a very, actually, extremely good way of working. We got a huge amount done in the day with a running buffet. Uh, and then we had that luxury of being able to rehearse scenes properly uh, on the day in between. The two big ones. Well, I think Anthony, I have, you know, I'm on record as saying many times, I think it was an absolutely superb performance. It was hugely helpful to me. And it was hugely helpful, the fact that he was so respectful of the, uh, of, uh, and moved by the, by the makeup and so on. And uh, was very vocal about that at the beginning, which really made me feel very much more confident because it's difficult. You know, it's a difficult situation. If there was the slightest chance of it being a bit of a laugh, I would have been sunk. He was terrifically helpful, very helpful. And I mean, really, we didn't have a lot of conversation during it because there wasn't much. I mean, I was not in a position to have much of a conversation, you know? Oh, I was terrified of John. Absolutely. I mean, he's a childhood a hero, you know, and I, I, I never quite knew what to say to John, you know. We, we got on, I think, terribly well, but you know, he was very, very aloof, John, and um, <coughs> very difficult. I mean, uh, I have every now and then people say that they're frightened of me, and I just think, well, 
if it's anything like that, then I must do everything I can to put them at their ease because it's not a nice feeling. It's not a very nice feeling to be in awe of someone. It's, but we got over it. We got over it. But I was, I was uh, very in awe of John Gilbert, who one of the great actors. Well, I think that uh, what Mike brought to it was um, an absolute reality. He knew how far to go and how how uh, how far to go and, and how far not to go. Um, and uh, he he had the style. He had the style. He had the style that David Lynch had in mind. I think absolutely to a T. Terrific performance. And I like. I mean, I, I really like Mike anyway. So it was that was easy. She was terrific in it, and uh, she shouldn't be left out. Yes, you're quite right. Shouldn't be left out at all. And she was hugely helpful. She was very encouraging. It was, uh, in the early days, because I think the first scene I did was that was that uh, the scene where I'm the friend scene. You know, when I'm in their house and looking at the mantelpiece and seeing the photographs and so on. And I really thought they'd found a way to make me not enjoy filming the first day. It was tough. I had no idea how it was going across or anything. She was very helpful, terrifically. And, and apart from that, her own performance was spot on. If I remember rightly, it was 14 weeks. And I say that because <laughs> I'd finished the main body of, um, of Heaven's Gate. And when we'd finished Elephant Man, I then rehearsed and did the prologue to Heaven's Gate after we'd done the whole of the Elephant Man, the whole of it. And it was a five-day shoot for the, uh, for the prologue, which is one of the biggest coups in film history, I think. And it cost the same as the whole of the Elephant Man. <laughs> it was a tiring shoot. Certainly. Oh, yes, it was. It was a demanding shoot, but it was hugely enjoyable. It was a great crew. And we've talked about, you know, Freddie Francis, talked about uh, David. David just grew in confidence as the film went on, too. He was, um, you know, he was in England. Nobody knew him. Nobody, you know, who was this upstart and so on, you know, young man, very young man, really, looking like a young Jimmy Stewart. And, um, uh, the people were very wary of him, you know, and quite dismissive of him to start with. I don't think they were by the end. He discusses everything, yes. I mean, David's a very open person. He's not, um, um, he'll talk about the images he's using and, and so on. Uh, he's very determined when he's got an idea. He doesn't, uh, <coughs> he's not easily dissuaded. I don't think anything was changed from the original script. Um, there was stuff that was left out. Uh, in fact, I can remember calling up once. I hadn't heard anything after we'd finished shooting for about three or four months. I said, how's it all going? And there was a pause at the other end, and they said, well, John, there's a film in here somewhere, which was fairly distressing. I thought, well, we, I don't know, I don't know what that means. Don't say all that effort's gone down the tubes. But uh, no, no, it came out fine. I think it probably changed my thought about quite a lot of things. Uh, it's difficult to put your finger on those, you know, but, uh, but anything of that kind of size and experience is a bit very peculiar if it didn't have some effect on you. And I think it definitely did. Um, probably in my own demeanour as well. In what way? Well, I think uh, it um, puts you into quite a humbling position. Exploitation is an endless argument because uh, whatever is good, there is always a bad to it. There is no, there is no, there is no such thing as being simply good or simply bad, uh, and you can always find. Um, a way of, of uh, pointing the finger in, in, a, in an adverse way. In the same way, if you really care, you can usually find rather a good way to point a finger too. It's often not as exciting. 
there was a lot of discussion about Treves' motives, yes. And there's no question of the fact that Treves was an ambitious man. Uh, but I think also there is no question of the fact that uh, that's why it's, it, it's never so black and white, you see. I mean, it's, uh, uh, he was, may well have started off the whole procedure as, uh, my goodness, this is really interesting, this is going, this is going to be fascinating as a, as a medical thing. Uh, and then he became involved with the person, with the very character and being of John Merrick. And I think uh, certainly the way in which we played it. I mean, I, you know, that uh, you can't be real. You can create your own reality, but you can't be real. So because we don't know what the reality of it was, and we'd, otherwise we'd be making a documentary. But uh, the way in which we saw it was that uh, he became more and more involved, and. Hopefully, as the audience, as he as he saw more, the audience saw more, and uh, really explaining quite a simple premise that the people are not necessarily what they appear to be. Well, let me say this about that, as J. F. Kennedy would say. Um, it was one of the few scenes that was shot on location. And this ghastly and um, pompous urinal, um, Victorian urinal, um, and it was perfectly hideous. And it was it was a difficult scene to do too because it was a very difficult part to play when you were being watched by the public as well. So one was hidden away as much as possible, but uh, one was still going through. Um, a very disquieting area when you when you were being watched by people all the time, you know. I knew from my from the way in which I intended to play it that it was the only point in the film where his emotions get control of him, and that he loses control rather of his emotions, and. Uh, and it's the rawest area in the film, and I knew that was going to be because I could. Think, well, I could think of, that was the way I couldn't see the, the script again was my, my 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 springboard, and that seemed to me to be intended. So that's how that came about. But I look when you say knew that that was going to be the defining moment of the film. I, we didn't even know that the film was going to be, you know, was, was going to have any, we didn't know that it was going to be regarded in the way that it has come to be regarded. No idea. I mean, I think we all felt that it was absolute film and that it was absolutely um, worth all the effort that was there. But I don't, we, we didn't know that it was going to be, have that sort of success. And I mean, it, it, was not, it wasn't even helped by Paramount, with all due respect, um, to the company, because they didn't know how to sell it. They had no idea how to sell it. I mean, uh, I can remember going to the first preview at Paramount, in uh, first public preview at Paramount in, in, in Los Angeles. And uh, the studio boss said, um, when I went up to him, because it was an extraordinary show. I mean, people falling all over me and weeping and crying, and it was only could happen in Los Angeles. <laughs> and um, uh, <coughs> I went up and said to, said to him, said, well, you sh your, your fears should be allayed, because I knew he was having worries about how to sell it. And he said, well, John, it's always difficult to sell a monster movie, which was, seemed to me an extraordinary thing to say, being as that's precisely what the film wasn't. Um, however, that's Hollywood thinking as it was there. As it was in front of you. There was nothing you could say about it. And they really didn't help it very much. It had one poster, I think, or I remember, on Sunset Strip. But when it opened, the lines were right round the cinema twice. So somewhere along the line, word of mouth had, had got out. Freddie Francis always reckoned that um, that word of mouth starts in the labs, that the boys in the labs say, we've got something coming out here.
I think we were aware it found its audience from the very beginning. But you see, these are these are in the days when you could uh, you could open a film in one cinema in New York and one cinema in Los Angeles, and then when it filled out to capacity and people were screaming, you could open it in another one and then another one, and it's what you call a mushroom opening. Uh, you can't very very rarely does that happen nowadays. It's uh, usually a blanket opening, in which case I think probably Elephant Man would have died the death because I think it needed. It was a word-of-mouth film. Uh, as I say, it wasn't given a huge amount of help from Paramount, as it was then. And uh, um, so, but I think we were aware of the fact that it was going to, that it found its audience all right, right from the very beginning. And then there was a big buzz about it. And of course, it was the beginning of the year. It was March opening. So we got scuppered for Oscars and things. What I know now is I didn't, certainly didn't know then that if you're, going to get, if you're going to get Oscars, then you have to have big campaigns, which uh, seems to me to be repulsive, really. Um, it shouldn't have to have campaigns, and you shouldn't have to go campaigning to people to vote for you. I mean, it's ridiculous somehow, you know? But uh, I spent most of the time on the, on the, on the Oscar night, because we've got eight nominations and no Oscars. And I said, look, if, if, um, if, if, if we'd got one Oscar, it would have destroyed the uniformity. We, we said, we can't have that. No, it's good. Eight Oscars, no Oscars. I mean, eight nominations, no Oscars, fine. And everybody lined, lightened up and laughed for a little bit, but then five minutes later, they were very serious about Oscars in, in, in America. It's the film, certainly, that, as, as far as I know, that David set out to make, and it's certainly the film that I set out to make. I mean, it's, look, everything in it is what I hope to do, you know, of course, you could always feel you could do one scene a bit better or whatever, you, but, you know, it's what, it's what was intended. Well, I think the film's about a lot of things. It's, uh, and, and most of them not, you know, they're not black and white. I think a lot of it's about nuance in, in, in life, but if you, the simplest way to look at it, it's, uh, it's um, a film about um, enlightening a public as to what is deeply misunderstood. It's, um, things are not what they seem to be. Uh, that what is, uh, it's, it's in a line really, it's in a line of things that, in, in, in a sense that I've, I've done and it's, uh, it's about many of the same things as say the naked, naked silver servant, it's about, uh, but it's much more right on in a sense. I did. I kept the, the, the head, the cranium, and I didn't know where to put it. And I had a very small house in, in Hampstead at the time, and I put it up on the top of a wardrobe and left it there. And then I was uh, getting a house in Oxfordshire, and I wasn't staying in the house in, in Hampstead very much. And I had a, a girlfriend looking after it. Um, I mean, a friend, not not a, not a girlfriend. If you don't have a friend looking after it. And uh, I got a call saying there's been a burglary. And I said, Oh God! Uh, yes, I had a feeling that night. She said, Don't worry though. She said nothing's been taken at all. They opened the wardrobe door, and the elephant man cranium fell out, and he obviously scarpered. He just ran for it, because uh, probably in the dark, he didn't know quite what, he'd, what, what, what had fallen out of the wardrobe, and it certainly looked grotesque enough to give him the frighten the knickers off him. So he, he disappeared, taking nothing at all, having knocked the back door down. So yes, I did keep something, and it protected me. I often think of him when, in respect of, of lives much less fortunate than our own. And, uh, and it's uh, something I think we perhaps don't think enough about, you know, I mean, it's, as I say, I don't want to sound precious, but the, we are in the, probably in the top 2% in the world in terms of what fortune we have. 
and um, when people are talking about uh, the sanctity of life, I think they should take a little look at other people who may not f totally agree. <laughs>